the scoot, you know, scooters and a lot of the kind of um, automotive companies and you know right. all of the designs that that they're creating. They're for people who are they they never actually create models that are for the majority of the country, right? And that's right. this is very problematic. And even when you look I at I never thought of that. Yes, right. right. And so when you look at any of the scooter comp, I mean, any of them, no one is designing things that actually result that that actually fit the the, the customer globally. Like this is this is a global issue, right? Welcome to Twenty Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. This episode is powered by Jay Ventures, a community-driven VC fund in Silicon Valley, in partnership with Leumi Tech, sponsored by Hippo Insurance, Opwest Labs, Turing, Hillel at Stanford, Leap, and in media partnership with C-Tech. Welcome to another episode of 20 Minute Leaders. I am joined today by Jessica Richman, Trade and Investment Director, The Australian Trade. Jessica serves as a San Francisco-based Trade and Investment Director for the Australian Trade and Investment Commission. In this role, Jessica helps US-based tech companies launch and expand in Australia. She also assists Australian tech companies with their US expansion. Additionally, Jessica acts as founder and CEO of The Visible Collective, where she advises companies on product development, marketing, and new business development to better serve customers labeled overweight or obese by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Ms. Richmond previously held roles in marketing, growth, and strategy at walmart.com. One of her greatest achievements was a 10-month solo around-the-world trip. Jessica Richmond, welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really honored to have you here. You're the Director of Investment and Quantum Technologies Lead for the Australian Trade and Investment Commission. Well, I'll have to understand a little bit about what that means, but what I'm also curious to talk to you about is your work as the founder and CEO of the Visible Collective, uh, working to advise companies uh, to better serve people of size. And obviously, you know, this is a, a, something that, that uh, we, we know and we, we are aware of, and it's a growing global um, epidemic, right, in, in the last few decades. And so I'm really excited to understand from a more of a, pro- from a company's perspective and from a product development perspective, some of your thoughts. But Jessica, tell me a little bit about your, your journey and how do you find yourself converging to these two verticals that you're working on? Absolutely. So my journey is very circuitous. Um, I grew up in, I grew up in Los Angeles and kind of did, did a variety of different things there as a, as a, as a kid. I worked in an entertainment PR agency. I worked dressing models and styling them for the runway. (laughs) Um, I worked uh, at Planet Hollywood for two summers. I completely forgot that, which was a very formative experience. So I, I kind well, of just wait, had a lot wait, wait. of... We have to, we're, this episode is now going to be on Planet Hollywood. What did you do at Planet Hollywood? So I was a, I was a, um, a, a merchandise salesperson at Planet Hollywood and like, a, and like an assistant hostess at Planet Hollywood. So it was the one in Beverly Hills. So it was a very, uh, it was a very interesting environment um, at the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So well, what happens after? So, um, and, and then kind of, I, I, I took that journey to go to, to go to UC Berkeley, Cal, go bears. Um, I know, I know you're a Stanford, a Stanford person, but I have to plug the, plug in the go bears. So, um, and, and there I studied business at the, at the business school undergrad and, um, just kind of used some of the knowledge that I had learned and developed in various kind of internships and roles, um, in LA throughout high school. I was always kind of working throughout high school and kind of doing interesting different projects. Um, and after, after, Cal, I went to go work for Walmart for almost nine years in a in a wow. variety of different roles, um, primarily focused on kind of marketing and strategy uh, at at Walmart, where I was kind of marketing m- marketing managing various categories at Walmart. So it could have been apparel, could have been sporting goods, um, consumables, kind of health and wellness, ver- various different divisions that I was working in, and also kind of running mm-hmm. some of the, the larger holiday campaigns and working with different brands to help them kind of plug into some of those campaigns and working with Arkansas, because um, I was with walmart.com, working with Arkansas to create more omnichannel campaigns. So learned a lot about different products and different customer needs there um, and and how kind of to focus really on the customer and what their what their needs and their wants are. So that's kind of that, the beginning of it. Then I left to go travel around the around the world for about uh, a year, 
um, by yeah. myself, which was which was very phenomenal. Um, and and of course, I, I ran into Israelis everywhere, um, as one does. Um, in particular, in Bolivia, uh, that was of a course. that was an that was a that was a, actually someone tried to speak Hebrew to me on the on, on on a bus going from one city to another. And I and I had they asked me like twenty five years ago, I would have spoken fluent Hebrew, but but it's been a long time. So. Um, but but that was a very memorable experience. It was from someone from wow. Shlomi's tours. I, I I love it. So um, the you know after that experience, I think, and I spent eight eight of eight months of that in in Asia, and it was very wow. clear to me that Asia Asia is dynamic, and that whole region is really there's so much future growth um, occurring there. Uh, so I had a really a, a really strong passion for that region, um, and I actually never made it to Australia. It's important to note I never made it to Australia. But when I came back, I worked in some startups, and then I worked. Um, I thought that I wanted to run a jewelry business, so I actually went to go work at a jewelry store, helping uh, clients with picking out specific gifts, with designing engagement rings, understanding more about various gemstones. Um, and diamonds. I like diamonds, but I'm a fan of sapphires, Aussie sapphires in particular. Um, and uh, the it just occurred to me after working there for a couple of months that that was not that that was not what I was going to do. That was not my calling. I, I like to buy jewelry, but I think you know I and 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 I like to talk about jewelry, but I don't think I wanted to sell jewelry. So I landed at the the Australian Trade Investment Commission, which is really the commercial arm of the Australian government. And our focus is, my focus particularly based in, in the Bay Area, is helping tech companies launch offices and, um, com- you know, do R&D in Australia. Uh, and also helping, and this is kind of a lesser part of my job, but helping Australian companies launch in the United States. So wow. that's really wow. what my focus is. And, and the, the objective is really drive Australia's economic development. Right. So, so as they develop in the United States, they obviously bring back and 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 help and help Australia prosper. Now, very very quickly before we move to the Visible Collective, what 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 does it entail to to help Australian companies break through to the U.S. market? Is it mainly in in cultural understandings and in networking and 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 helping them get get a foothold on the ground? What what does that actually tangibly mean? Yeah, it's it's. It really is individualized to the different company and where they actually are at in their journey. Um, uh-huh. A lot of it is understanding, yes, cultural differences, which of which there are many. There, there, you know, we speak the same language, but um, as as a friend once said, we're divided by a common language. Um, we speak it, but it's very, very different, very different cultures. So I think that's a really big part of it. Um, it's also just understanding Silicon Valley culture, especially if people are coming here, which is also another you know, beast, um, rather than, we all know that Silicon Valley is very different than, than the rest of the country. And then it's generally, it, it, in my particular case, because I have colleagues who work on like more of the specifics around how do you register the company and how do you kind of do stuff like that. But my focus is really who are the, who are the key people in your industry that you can talk to who are going to help you really understand the industry in the United States. And that's kind of a lot of the work I do is you know, connecting people to other key people who will provide them with the the right information, um, and and it's also kind of working with investors as well, and kind of getting people networked into in, in, you know networked into investors. Um, so it really depends on what the individual individual needs are of the client at the time. But you know, I've worked with with many of the many of the the well known Aussie companies that have that have grown quickly here, and and you know, are, gro- are growing quickly here, um, that you've probably heard of. So it's, I, 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 I'm not really supposed to speak about particular clients, but the ones you you're hearing of in the, in the news lately probably are ones that I'm talking to and working Amazing. with or have worked with. Yep. Amazing. So, so two and a half years ago, you you started the, the visible collective. T- tell me a little bit about even, you know, before the, before what the visible collective actually does, Tell me a little bit about the pain point that you're working on solving, you know, on, on the other vertical that you're in. Yeah. So it's really, I'll start off with, it's really challenging. Um, and what is, and, 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 and I'll start off with how I got there. So I have always been existing in, in a larger body, like a fat body, whatever, whatever people call it. I, in, in my particular case, I, I don't, I don't think that the word overweight or obese is a customer facing term, nor do the majority of customers, by the way, they're very medical terms, but 
like from a descriptive perspective, I live in a, in a fat body and I don't, I don't see it as a bad word. So I've always kind of grown up with it, with an eating disorder. I've always had kind of issues with binge eating my whole entire life. Um, I've tried everything you can imagine in the entire world to try to change that. Um, but I've kind of come to this, this, this place of kind of trying to learn and live and accept my body and, and figure out what it means to exist in the world in my body. Now, how this translates, so, so, so taking that into, into mind, right. Um, then taking into consideration all the, all the work at Walmart with understanding the customer and with really working in every different category that the customer would shop in every, every category. And it occurred to me that there's really a, there's a lack of understanding of the fact that pretty much every product and service will, will likely need to change as a result of people looking different across, across the world. Yes. And so when we talk about, you know, and, and I, and, and a lot of my, a lot of my, my job is also right education. So, you know, when you speak about, when you speak about kind of epidemics and pandemics related to, you know, related to this particular customer, you know, I, I encourage you and it's, and it's everyone. I mean, this is, this is when I say education, it's a lot of education. It's, you know, would you refer like people are aging globally, right. But would you refer to it as like a pandemic or an epidemic? Like not right. Like there's, there's, there's a sense of judgment that, you know, we all have to think about what words do we use and how does that create a sense of judgment for a group of people? Because I guarantee you as one of those people, you know, and I've been many different sizes my whole life. It's not like, you know, I've been, but they've all been in the double digits of clothing sizes, right? Which, which would, I, you know, fall into what is considered a a higher BMI. So, uh, you know, I would urge you to think about what do kind of the words I say mean? Because the, that group, this group of people, like there's already so much judgment and we already spend pretty much 90% of the day judging ourselves, right? That it's like adding an additional layer adds more complexity, but you know, and it's not, and is not helpful. And I think, so that's one of the first things that I have to kind of educate people about is, you know, a lot of organizations and especially in Silicon Valley, a lot of the companies that are getting funded they're it's, they're about weight loss, right? And they're about, and, and, and when you look at statistics, it is very challenging to lose, it is very challenging to lose weight and to keep it off. Very, very challenging. Now, if that's the case, and if we as as a society kind of come to acknowledge that that's the case. The question then becomes, how do we meet the customer where they're at? Um, whether it is with healthy, eat- healthy eating startup, like, wh- like whatever field you're in, if it's an auto, like I think a lot about um, the sco- you know, scooters and a lot of the kind of um, a- automotive companies and you know, right. all of the designs that, that they're creating, they're for people who are, they, d- they never actually create models that are for the majority of the country. Right. And that's, right. this is very problematic. And even when you look I at it, I never thought of that. Yes. Right. right. And so when you look at any of the scooter comp, I mean, any of them, no one is designing things that actually result that, that actually fit the, the, the customer globally. Like this is This is a global issue, right? Like we talk about China, we talk about the United States, you know, th- this is, this is happening pretty much in, in all, in, in all major developed countries that people are getting larger. So, you know, what I, what I try to elevate with companies, you know, whether it's a transportation company or it's a healthcare company or it's an insurance company is how do you create paradigms that actually fit the customer as they are? And as frankly, they're going to be, because not only, you know, are people going to be larger, but generally when people are larger, their, their children, their children are larger. And so the question also then becomes, and I'm not, I'm look, I'm not saying it's it's all up to the individual customer, right? Like everyone has their own lives and everyone has their own body. And that's another thing is, is companies shouldn't, you know, companies and individuals shouldn't judge people. But, you know, and if someone wants to kind of go and pursue whatever plan that they want to pursue or they want to eat differently or they want to eat healthy, you know, whatever it is, we should just meet that customer where they're at and not create a paradigm from which, you know, where, where we're coming from. And I think that's that's the big right. thing that that people don't under understand. And so that's kind of how I work with companies and help, help educate them. So they do understand that a bit. A bit but more. I have to ask Jessica, even from an, a purely economic perspective, like the example that you mentioned with the, with the, with the automotive, right. And the, trans- and the scooters, Yep. why is it that the scooter companies don't understand internally 
that they need to cater to the majority of the population, which may not be comfortable or may not fit this this tiny, tiny scooters that they're designing. I, and now I'm I'm genuinely I'm wondering this. <laughs> um, I wonder it too. <laughs> Uh, and frankly, and, 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 and it's not only the scooter companies, but it's actually, it's actually the automotive industry at large, um, is, is right. problematic. So the majority of people, especially women, so uh, historically cars were tested with, with male bodies and they were tested with not necessarily with, you know, obese male bodies, right? I'll use it for the purposes as a descriptor. So what, what happens is the majority of people, especially women who are larger, which is a very large percentage of the country are driving unsa- in cars unsafely because they haven't been tested for that. And so, you know, you ask, you, you, and this is a well-documented thing. If, if you Google it, you can find crash test dummies, you know, not reflective of the population. This is a, it's a very common, and there are, there are companies like Humanetics and different companies that are trying to address this with different crash test dummies. But, you know, the, it comes down to a policy level, right? So, and, and this is where a lot of the, you know, when you look at a lot of the transport companies, unless the policy changes, right? Unless there's policy changes on a government level, th- there's not going to necessarily be changes on an individual company level. Um, there are companies that design transportation solutions for larger bodies. Like there are, there are bicycle companies, that, there are different companies like that. But it, it does shock me that, you know, that the, the, the majority of the companies don't really look at this as a as an issue. I mean, maybe it's because there's more short term thinking around let's create a product, let's grow the market, and let's sell it, right? And it's not around creating long term sustainable companies, right? So I think there's part of that. If you're just looking to create, and and this is where I go back to like a lot of the companies that are in the space of like in the space of. I'll just, I'll call it the diet space, right? Be, for, yeah. for, for the sake of, I, I'm, I'm not going to call it the sustainable healthcare space. I'm going to call it the diet space. Right. A lot of them, they're looking for, they're looking for not to create sustainable companies, but, but they're looking for how, how do we get the fastest return in the fastest time possible, right? And right. so, yes, you could look at this and say, yes, there's a lot of fat people in the United States. How can we help them get thinner? You know, how can we generate significant data that's going to, you know, make a healthcare company bias, right? And and that that's fairly, you know, that that's a that's a straightforward well-trodden path. It's much more difficult to create a path of let's really understand the customer, let's continue on a journey with them their whole lives. You know, and 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 that's that's really what I'm trying to get companies to understand. And and it's hard especially because, you know, one of the challenges is it, people who are who are in larger bodies, it's not a protected class in the United States. And so a lot of the work that companies do, especially in the diversity inclusion space, can inform their product development, right? And so we see a right. lot more people hiring, you know, people of color and people of different genders and, and sexual identities and orientations, and that can help inform product development. Um, and that, and by the way, and it's also mandated by the, by the government that you can't discriminate right. against those people. Yeah. It's not mandated by the federal government that you can't discriminate against someone based on size. So you are also then missing out on talent that can help you identify, well, how are you forgetting the fact that the majority of the country actually doesn't look like you, right? And I think that really becomes an issue in places, in coastal places, and particularly in places like the Bay Area, where the truth is that, they're, they're, that it's, 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 it's harder to find someone who is considered fat to hire, right? Like, because it's, it's just not, the, the demographics are different than they would be in the Midwest, or in the South. So I, I think right. personally, the majority of the interesting companies and in product development will likely come out of places where people experience the problem set. Right? Wow. Jessica, I think that <clears throat> you've opened up an, a new type of thinking for me. <clears throat> and I think it's going to take some time to sink in. And, and, I, and I really appreciate you coming on and sharing because I, I, it makes perfect sense. And, and I think that there's obviously the way that the societal way of looking at it, but I'm, I'm a, also on the economic way of looking at it purely, you know, for the, for the benefit of, for the win-win situation, it's, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. So thank you for taking Correct. the time to share with me. Uh, Jessica, take me back to your childhood a little bit. What, what really fascinated you as a kid? You know, <laughs> everything. <laughs> I know that's a weird response, um, but you know, to to go back, I I loved I loved fashion as a kid. I loved fashion. Um, growing up in LA and kind of growing up, um, especially in my formative years in in Beverly Hills, from like the eighth to twelfth grade, I was really in- interested in it. 
you know, and this, by the way, also informs the visible collect. I was interested in it, but no one ever designed anything that would fit my body, right? And at that point, I was like, you know, really much, much smaller. And even then, companies weren't kind of designing things, right? Like, like that would fit me. So I think that just that juxtaposition was was very interesting in growing up with that. Um, so I think fashion always interested me. People always interested me. I mean, all 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 people, right? Like, I, when I was at Planet Hollywood you know, I became very good friends with all the people that work there. And I became friends with like the random celebrities that would come in Planet Hollywood, um, uh, like Gary Coleman or like, you know, different, different random celebrities that had been around for a long time that would still come. Um, I always think, and I I think I learned this from, I think I learned this from my mom um, because she would always talk to everyone. And I, I always believe that everyone has something to teach us. Everyone, like every single person. Um, and so I think, People really, when it comes down to it, I guess it's really people that fascinate me. Um, and I, so I try to engage in as many conversations as possible. Um, and my, my office actually, my, the Australian consulate makes fun of me because I always end up meeting Australians everywhere I go and kind of bringing them, you know, bringing them back and kind of looping them into what the consulate's doing. And, and that's a part of how I've, you know, kind of succeeded in my job is because I do talk to everyone and I am very attentive in terms of accents and in terms of what people are talking about. Amazing, amazing. And what inspires you today in your in your, in your day to day work? Either with the Australian government, whether it be with the with the Visible Collective, or or anything personally. Yeah, I think um, helping helping individuals and helping. So it, in in my work with 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 Australian Trade Commission, it's really it's helping people and helping companies succeed. I think that's right. one thing. I get significant joy for, from that. Um, and then in terms of Visible Collective. And this is why it's harder. It's transforming the way the perce- transforming perception globally, um, and that that is a that is a lifetime job, right? That that many lifetime job, right? Is how do you how do you transform perceptions? And I do believe that business is a tool. If you can make people see the economic value, right, be, in doing something, that arguably can also help transform the way. That can help transform people's perception. So there's a significant uh, connection between that that goal and being able to to help people understand economically what the impact is. I love it. And Jessica, what are three words you would use to describe yourself? So I, th- I thought about this and I thought about it again. Um, the I think inquisitive is definitely one um, to the point where it's it's I ask a lot of questions, which I think annoys my sometimes definitely annoyed my classmates in school. Um, sometimes annoys my, my colleagues now and definitely annoys my boyfriend. Um, <laughs> and, uh, networker. I, I, I try to meet as many people as possible. And then also kind of related to inquisitive is, is also kind of engaged, right? Like it's not only being wanting to learn more, but it's then actually like, once you start talking to me, actually just like continuing to care about what you're saying and being, you know, genuinely engaged in what, in what you're talking about. Amazing. Jessica, thank you so much. This was so great. Uh, thank you for sharing your, your passions and your work, which is fascinating and opening up so, some interesting questions that I need to ask now. Uh, so thank you very much and stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thanks. You too. Mm-hmm.